Well, the spotlight's on me this evening, but uh, we really should have the spotlight on our Saviour. Our first reading this evening is from Luke chapter 6 and beginning at verse 12. One of those days, Jesus went out to a mountainside to pray and spent the night praying to God. When morning came, he called his disciples to him and chose 12 of them, whom he designated apostles. Simon, whom he named Peter, his brother Andrew, James, John, Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, Thomas, James, son of Alphaeus, Simon, who was called the Zealot, Judas, son of James, and Judas Iscariot, who became a traitor. He went down with them and stood on a level place. A large crowd of his disciples was there, and a great number of people from all over Judea, from Jerusalem and from the coastal region around Tyre and Sidon, who had come to hear him and be healed of their diseases. Those troubled by impure spirits were cured, and the people all tried to touch him, because power was coming from him and healing them all. Looking at his disciples, he said, Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who hunger now, for you will be satisfied. Blessed are you who weep now, for you will laugh. Blessed are you when people hate you, when they exclude you and insult you, and reject your name as evil because of the Son of Man. Rejoice in that day and leap for joy, because great is your reward in heaven. For that is how the ancestors treated the prophets. But woe to you who are rich, for you have already received your comfort. Woe to you who are well fed now, for you will go hungry. Woe to you who laugh now, for you will mourn and weep. Woe to you when everyone speaks well of you, for that is how their ancestors treated the false prophets. But to you who are listening, I say, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who ill-treat you. If someone slip, slaps you on one cheek, turn to them the other also. If someone takes your coat, do not withhold your shirt from them. Give it to everyone who asks you. And if anyone takes what belongs to you, do not demand it back. Do to others as you would have them do to you. If you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who are good to you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners do that. And if you lend to those from whom you expect repayment, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners, expecting to be repaid in full. But love your enemies. Do good to them, and lend to them without expecting to get anything back. Then your reward will be great, and you will be children of the Most High, because he is kind to the ungrateful and wicked. Be merciful, just as your Father is merciful. The word of the, of the Lord. We have a second reading in Acts chapter 8, beginning at the first verse, or at least part of the first verse. The previous chapter has dealt with the martyrdom of uh, Stephen, and Acts chapter 8 starts with Saul's approval of the killing of Stephen. 
Saul, who later, of course, became Paul. On that great day, a great persecution. On that day, a great persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem, and all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. Godly men buried Stephen and mourned deeply for him. But Saul began to destroy the church. Going from house to house, he dragged off both men and women and put them in prison. Those who had been scattered preached the word wherever they went. Philip went down to a city in Samaria and proclaimed the Messiah there. When the crowds heard Philip and saw the signs he performed, they paid close attention to what he said. For with shrieks, impure spirits came out of many, and many who were paralysed or lame were healed. So there was great joy in that city. A little further a reading on in Acts chapter 9. Meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogue in Damascus. So if he found any there who belonged to the way, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. As he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the earth and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute, persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting, he replied. Now get up and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. The men travelling with Saul stood there speechless. They heard the sound, but did not see anyone. Saul got up from the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand into Damascus. For three days he was blind and did not eat or drink anything. I've been looking over the, the different days and Sundays I've been coming here uh, spasmodically, looking at some of the people in the Bible who get just a short mention. We, we've covered a group of people, different people, diverse group of people, the craftsmen who led the work in building the ta traveling tabernacle for the people of Israel going through the desert. The one who gave his tomb to house the body of Christ. The surprised father of John the Baptist. Barnabas, the encourager. People who f first don't seem to be that important, who appear and disappear having made their contribution to God's great plan. Today, I want to look at a group of people who seem central somehow in the Bible, but the Bible seems to, by and large, have forgotten them. I mean John's, uh, sorry, I mean Jesus' disciples. Twelve of them were chosen by him. One, Judas we know, turned traitor and met a grisly death. Three or four others have major roles in the work of Christ in the Bible. But the others were chosen, but seem to, from the time of Christ's death, we hear hardly anything of them, or nothing of them individually and very little collectively. Well, we meet the disciples early on in some of the Gospels and we read the reading from uh, Matthew of the cho choosing by Christ of his disciples. So let's just uh, remind ourselves there 
These are the names of the 12 apostles. First Simon, who's called Peter, his brother Andrew, James, the son of Zebedee, and his brother John, Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew, the tax collector, James, son of Alphaeus and Thaddeus, Simon the Zealot, and Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. And we have a list that was from Matthew, as a similar list in Mark and in Luke. And by the time we get to Acts, first book of Acts, uh, chapter in Acts, then we've got a similar list, of course, missing out Judas after the resurrection and the ascension. And, the, and Peter particularly, but the, the group of now 11 rather than 12, thought they needed to have a replacement. Peter looked at some of the scriptures which said that the place should be filled, the places should be filled. And they elected a replacement for Judas, Matthias. Now, some commentators suggest this was a mistake. They should have waited and see how God was led in the future. Perhaps they hurried as 12 seemed the right number of apostles matching the number of Israelite tribes. Some say they should have waited and discovered God's plan, the plan that it was Saul who became Paul should become the 12th apostle. Well, I'm not sure that the situation is that clear. It's true that Paul introduces himself in his letters as an apostle. And we don't hear of Matthias again. But is the absence of Matthias any proof? Because we get in the, re in the rest of the New Testament some, refresh refresh sorry, some references to some of the apostles. Peter seems to be the natural leader of the Twelve. He effectively dominates the first part of the, chapter, the book of Acts. First 15 chapters indeed. And then we've got two letters he has written. But after Acts 15, the com commanding figure is Paul. Now, some external evidence to the Bible suggests that Peter was crucified in about AD 64. It's also suggested that about that time Paul was executed as well. But how about the others? John lived long. We read him as the writer of the gospel that bears his name and the last book in the Bible, Revelation, and three short epistles. He's a close companion of Peter in the early chapters of Acts. His brother James was executed by King Herod in Acts chapter 12. The letter we know as the letter from James is not that James, it's the, it's the half-brother of our Saviour, not the brother of John. Matthew wrote a gospel, bearing his names. But about the others? Andrew, Bartholomew, Thomas, Simon the Zealot, the other James, the other Judas, Philip, not the Philip who was the deacon along with Stephen, but Philip the, the Apostle. Then we last we hear of them as part of the eleven choosing the successor for Judas Iscariot. Seven names, seven close companions to Jesus for two or three years. Hearing the message he, pro he proclaimed, following him closely. Now, well, there were, were they doing nothing to forward the gospel? I don't think that can be true. One unauthorised, unsubstantiated source says that Thomas went to India and preached there. Whether it's true or not, it seems to me that those who walked and talked 
with Jesus and dedicated years of their lives to following him would not have gone into their shell. It seems to me the style of Luke to have a spotlight on individual people. So first of all on Peter, then on Paul. He doesn't cover in Acts all the different apostles as they followed on. He picks out individuals. Philip, the other Philip, the evangelist coming up to an Ethiopian in the desert to explain the gospel. And that was the forerunner of an expansion into the Gentile world. As we read a little in Acts chapter 8. And this was cemented by Peter's um, encounter with Cornelius the centurion later on in Acts. There's evidence that does exist that the knowledge of the gospel rapidly spread from those 40 days on when the uh, Pentecost, the Spirit came down upon the 11 and we start to see the beginning of this. But there was turbulent times. We read in Acts chapter 8, how the infant church was scattered following the great persecution which Saul of Tarsus is the central figure. What would it accomplish was that ordinary Christians, if we can put, call them that, no Christian is ordinary, but an ordinary Christians fled from Jerusalem to other more remote parts of Israel and into the mixed racial area of Samaria. They fled, but they didn't leave their faith. They preached the gospel. They preached the word, we're told in Acts chapter 8 and verse 4. They preached the word wherever they went. However, the apostles remained in Jerusalem. They preached the word wherever they went. Sometimes that's paraphrased is that they gossiped the gospel. It was the very words on their lips wherever they went. They had had to run away as so many of the people down here uh, and our photographs have had to flee. But they took with them their faith. They spoke of him, our saviour to making and made disciples of all nations as Je Jesus had commanded in the end of Ma chapter in the last chapter of Matthew's gospel we next hear of christian refugees spreading out beyond the borders of israel Acts chapter 11 has this. Now those who had been scattered by the persecution that broke out when Stephen was killed travel as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, Antioch, spreading the word only among the Jews. They went to Phoenicia, which is present-day Lebanon, to Cyprus, to Antioch in present-day Turkey. But they be and then they began to speak to Greeks also, telling them the good news about Jesus Christ. They broke through the racial barriers. The Lord's hand was with them, we read, and a great number of people believed and turned to the Lord. So the gospel broke out of a straitjacket and was no longer looked on as a Jewish religion. It was received by the, great, the Greeks. There was continued persecution in the Jerusalem area. James, brother of John, executed. Peter in prison but escaped by a miracle. Persecution didn't go away. In fact, it grew. 
We move on. A couple of decades and Nero became the emperor in Rome. And there was a rumour went about that uh, there was a fire in Rome and that Nero was, in, was responsible for it. So he had to divert that away from himself. So he blamed it on the Christians and had many tortured and put to death in the most gruesome ways. And two of those were Peter and Paul. Remember that uh, Peter's death was predicted by our Lord. In John chapter 21, we read, Jesus said to Peter, feed my sheep. Very truly, I tell you, when you were younger, you dressed yourself and went where you wanted when you're old, you will stretch out your hands and somebody else will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. He was crucified and room, uh, tradition has it. He was crucified upside down. And it's still the case for many Christians across this world. There's those who are being persecuted, put to death, imprisoned because they are Christians and for no other reason. Each month for uh, Newtown Church, I, I produce a prayer sheet for the church listing the events and people to pray for. But I always put in a section on the persecuted church. Uh, and looking at the last few months, it has reference to those who are <coughs> oppressed in Nigeria, Haiti, India and Pakistan, Finland, Laos, Ukraine, and for the coming month, Mexico. Worldwide, effectively, it seems as Someone who is being persecuted for their faith is being is the norm, not the exception. We are the ones, the favoured ones, who are not being persecuted so directly. But how does it affect our witness? Firstly, an apostle. Another meaning of that word translation can be messenger. The original apostles, the original 12, had an additional qualification that they'd seen Christ and worked with him and been with him for a time, some two or three years. How does that fit in with Paul calling himself an apostle? On the road to Damascus, he had a vision of Jesus who spoke directly to him. How about us? We see Jesus, not with our eyes, but within the words of Scripture. And we hear his voice speaking to us as we read his words. We should all be messengers, apostles with a small a. To us comes the same dilemma. Do we speak out for Jesus? and expect persecution, which in this country comes with a very small P? Or do we go forth and bring his message and bring his message to others? Or do we hide away? Well, it seemed the people of the time of Saul and Paul, who became Paul, were ready to speak out. How are we going to fulfill that great commission? At the end of Matthew chapter 24. Then the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him. But some doubted. 
Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and earth has been given me. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing in the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. And surely I'm with you, always to the very end of the age. Not just a message for the eleven or the twelve, but for all those who claim to be his. Strangely, it says even for those eleven there, it says some doubted. Our uh, pastor this morning, Pastor Mark, uh, said, quoted this and suggested that the devout Jewish uh, people there found it difficult to worship a man, but he's a special man. He's God incarnate. Well, how are we going to follow in the apostles' footsteps, taking the message not just across the boundary from Judea into Samaria, not from Samaria into Cyprus or uh, Lebanon or wherever. The message has got to go out right across the world. And you've got indication of this again in those photos that uh, one there serving Wobble Highway in uh, a country a fair way away from us here. But there are others who travel to bring the message right across the world. Did all the 11 leave Israel and travel with the message? Well, it seems that some may, and others perhaps stood for Christ in the hostile environment of Jerusalem. We can't all travel to the far ends of the world, but what are we doing here? in the place that God has set us. Remember that Jesus made no mistake in choosing his close followers. Even Judas was Christ's particular choice. We may not know all their special roles in building the kingdom of God. Be assured, each one of them had a role chosen for them. And so have we. What has God got for us to do for him? For some Christians, it's the path of persecution. For others, a quieter life. But we must all be ready to stand for Christ in this world. Age is no barrier for standing and suffering. You may have heard of the Bishop of Smyrna, Polycarp, in the middle of the 2nd century AD, around about 150 AD. In the martyrdom, Polycarp is recorded as saying on the day of his death, and I'm quoting from Wikipedia here, eight and six years have I served him, and he's done me no wrong. He had lived at least... 86 years. Polycarp said, and uh, that rings a bell with me because that's how long I've lived, I'm 86. Polycarp goes on to say, how then can I blaspheme my king and saviour? You threaten me with a fire that burns for a season and after a little while is quenched, but you're in, they're ignorant of the fire of everlasting punishment that's prepared for the wicked. Polycarp was burned at the stake and pierced with a spear for refusing to burn incense to the Roman emperor. On his farewell, he said, I bless you, Father, for judging me worthy of this hour, so in the company of martyrs I may share the cup of Christ. Others, like John, died a quiet death in the island of Patmos, exiled but living a contemptitive life. Do we each know 
what Jesus has chosen us and what he's chosen us for, what role we serve. Are we his ambassadors, his messengers, his apostles, the little a? Our deeds of faith may not be written in the ecclesiastical records, but what we do for the least and the greatest is we can bestow, bestow a knowledge of Jesus is to, and what we do, one will know, our Lord and Saviour will know what we have done to serve him, to spread the knowledge of Jesus Christ throughout this dark world. We may not get our names down, written down, the uh, new town we're just coming up to celebrating uh, rather lately, belatedly, our uh, 200th anniversary. Uh, and a book has been written of the history. And much is in there of the uh, of what happened over those 200 years and uh, the people involved. But there must be many people over those 200 years who don't get a mention in the book. There's many of Jesus' disciples who don't get mentioned in the Bible. But God knows, Christ knows, what his people have done, how they have stood for him, what message they have been able to bring, how they have served him. Well done, good and faithful servant, will one day be said to many. Are we ready to do that, to achieve that accolade from our Saviour?